Hello, everyone. Welcome to the today's webinar, uh, talking about FIFPRO. Today, we have the pleasure to host uh, Alexandra gomez Bronwood. Uh, she's a senior legal counsel of FIFPRO, and she's also a judge of the FIFA Dispute Resolution Chamber since uh, 2017. And uh, she uh, was uh, recently uh, named as co-director of the ISDE Global Master in Sports Management and Legal Skills. Hello, Alexandra. How are you? Hi. Hello. Really a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure for me and for all the attendees. I have a, a lot of questions for you. I, I am really, really curious to know more about your activity and uh, about the hot topics uh, like uh, maternity leave and, and all of that. And in general, the uh, legal protection for female football players, as, uh, you, as you should know, uh, women football is growing a lot. And so I, I have a lot of questions for you. Can't wait to, to start. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for, for being here, for taking part to our, our webinar. And then uh, I would like to, to start with the first question, uh, which is uh, related to your daily uh, activities, Council of FIFPRO. What, could you explain us what is FIFPRO? How, how do you work? In order to represent the professional football players to defend their, their labor rights. Um, and we are composed by a national um, players association in different countries uh, or unions sometimes um, that represent their uh, professional football players at the national level. And they are all members of uh, FIFPRO. So we are, if you look at the structure, let's say it's a little bit similar to that of FIFA. So you have FIFA composed of all the member associations, all those federations, while well, we are composed by all our player um, associations. We have at the moment um, 70 players associations around the world that are members of FIFPRO in all the continents all around the world, bigger, smaller, uh, super developed or not so much. And so there's a, there's a whole variety. Um, easier contexts and more difficult contexts. So uh, a lot of work, very varied and, and really interesting. Uh, but the core, let's say, what we do and why we exist is to protect the labor rights of those professional players. Because to start with, we still live in a world where in some countries, professional football players are not considered workers. And this is a, a major concern because of course, that carries a lot of consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can imagine. Can, could you make us some example? I'm, I'm very curious. For example, uh, about the what well, is the African situation, the Asian situation? Because you know, when we think about football, we always think about Cristiano, Ronaldo, Messi, Buffon, but. Uh, as you were saying, I mean, there are so many different contexts and so many different situations all, all over the world. So what could you make us some, some example of your activity in like more difficult uh, contexts? Yeah, well, uh, that, that's, a, that's a, good, it's a good question. And actually, um, it's a question that I get a lot, like when, you know, I meet new people and they're like, oh, what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a lawyer, where do you work? I work for... Uh, the International Players, uh, Football Players Union, they're like, International Players Union, like, why do they need a union if they're all millionaires? <laughs> uh, and, and that is, of course, the, the, the common perception, because those are the, the players that we know, right? As, 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 um, as fans, those are the matches that we watch, those are the players that we know. And, uh, and that's a, a big problem, let's say, for us, for our, for our work, because it makes it more difficult for people to understand the real situation. And we have been saying this for many years. Um, and in 2016, we, we carried out a very in-depth study, uh, the, the employment situation of professional football players around the world. We had more than 14,000 
um, professional football players um, surveyed. And, and then we really got uh, the numbers, which did not surprise us, but it was a great thing to do because we did with the University of Manchester. So everything was done uh, very, very neatly. So it's really a, a, a very professional research. And then we can really show what we have been saying for so long uh, uh, in numbers. And, and th that study shows that um, almost half of the players around the world earn less than 1,000 US dollars per month. So very far, very far from those millionaires that we sometimes uh, watch on TV. And what makes things worse, and this is probably the biggest um, problem in, in, in football nowadays, is that players do not receive their pay on time. They do not receive it on time when they earn better and they do not receive it on time when they earn less. So imagine if you earn $1,000 or $500 or $300, because we have really a whole variety of salaries, it's not completely uncommon to see those salaries, and you're not paid for three months or for six months or for one year, which we do see as unbelievable as it may sound, you would understand how severe the situation is around the world. And somehow there is this social justification that, oh, but it's football. So, you know, I mean, probably the player, the club couldn't pay. It's like, yes, and because the, the, the club is the employer. And when they employ the player, they need to have a budget. So they need to pay, they must pay. It's an employee, right? And when we talk about players, everything is more relaxed. And even in the regulations, I mean, the RSCP has evolved enormously and we are now in a much better situation than we were before, for sure. Still, the player has to send the default notice granting 15 days to what should have been paid two months ago in order to tell the club that they do have 15 more days on top of the 60 days of, of late payment. It is insane. If FIFRA would tell me, I'm employed by FIFRA, if FIFRA would tell me, oh yeah, sorry, if we don't pay your salary, you have to wait two months and then send us a default notice of 15 days, I would go nuts. And I earn more than most of those players. So I can imagine the situation and somehow society has justified this. And this is completely wrong and we have to stop with this. It is insane. Sorry, I get really enthusiastic with this. <laughs> I, I can understand your, your point of view, of course. I mean, because I can imagine that you uh, face every day situation like that. So uh, I can understand why you get insane when you, when you discover all of these uh, incredible stories all over, all over the world. I mean, I really cannot think of any other industry that that would allow this, you know? It's not that all other employers always pay, I'm not saying that, or all other industries work fine, but it cannot be that almost half, almost half of the professional players receive their payment late. It is really? completely insane, completely insane. And, and something else that is worth mentioning, because we always say, we always think, oh yeah, yeah, because of course they did a worldwide study. So probably this is a situation in Africa, probably this is the situation in Asia. Yes, it is, but it also is the situation in Europe. In Europe, instead of being almost half, it is 32.2%. Well, I think that's a very, very, very high uh, percentage of late payment for Europe, for UEFA. With the money that UEFA, you know, has as a confederation, makes the money involved in football in Europe, and we have 32.2% of late payment. It's unbelievable. And when I talk about late payment, I'm not talking about, you know, receiving your salary maybe one week late or something. I'm talking about months. And when we go to the DRC and we have a player asking for his overdue payables, then no one considers that that player, in order to pay for his rent, he had to go and take a loan. And for that loan, no one gives loans for free, you know? 
So yeah. it's a whole thing that gets, it is unbelievable when we, when we finally can get players to, to get their money um, directly, let's say, because we normally do not defend, uh, well, normally, actually we do it more and more, but we're not supposed to be representing players um, uh, directly. Normally, this is the job that is done by our, by our member, our members, right? The player unions at national level. But the thing is that, of course, there are 211 um, uh, members of FIFA and we have uh, 70. So there are many countries in which we do not have a member. And if there's a player in, in trouble in a country where there is no players association, we as FIFA will not tell him, oh, good luck, you're not a member, you know? So we will help him uh, or her anyway. And, uh, and you, have, you really have to see the stories behind the things that these, these players go through. The, the clauses in the contract, we tend to ignore them even, even at, at the level of, of uh, FIFA DRC. So we, if it's a very abusive uh, clause, then we will deem it um, uh, null and void and, and we just move on. But we see it's, it's sick how natural we take these clauses, you know? It's like, oh yeah, abusive clause, uh, null and void. So we go to the calculation of Article 17 or, or in other things it can be as well. But we see very frequently, for example, uh, compensation clauses that if the player breaches uh, the contract, uh, the player earns, uh, I don't know, $2,000 per month. If the player breaches the contract, he needs to pay $60 million uh, for a one-year contract, for example, and if the club breaches the contract, they can pay one salary and that's okay. So, 60 million versus 2,000. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I when we do the DRC, it. we do say, like, this is null and void and we do not consider it, but shouldn't we go further than that? Like, how can we admit people imposing these clauses? You know? Yeah, yeah, crazy. Like, shouldn't we go for sporting sanctions or something? for being completely indecent. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, it, it happened to me to, to see this kind of clauses. Uh, to be honest, uh, uh, more when I, uh, when I read some contracts uh, related to the Arabic word. And uh, <laughs> so I, I can understand that that is an area that uh, leads to many different problems when we talk about contracts. So I'm sure that you had a lot of experience on that sense, but uh, it, it, it could be like a general uh, good, uh, bad, bad habit. And uh, I'm, I'm not so surprised to see that maybe also in Europe, you, you face the contract like that, unfortunately. So uh, this is why, I mean, I think that uh, uh, an union like Fifth Pro is very, very, very important. And according to, to this, I, I would like to ask you, which are like the most important uh, results that uh, you as FIPRO uh, managed to achieve uh, all over the years? Yeah, well, probably that's a little bit of a subjective uh, <laughs> question in the sense that, you know, I don't know if what I deem the most important is what is the most important to, to other people, right? But of course, I will look a little bit more at the, at the legal uh, side, although there were other achievements. Um, but of course, I mean, to start with uh, the Bosman ruling, um, it's not that it was our win. Uh, all credit, of course, is for, for Jean-Marc Bosman, but we were there by him. Um, we, as an organization, I was not there. I was too young, guys. Don't <laughs> think that I'm so old. No, <laughs> no but uh, so, so FIFRO was supporting him all the way through. Uh, legally, psychologically, and financially. Um, and because of all the, the stories that I've heard, I know for sure that if we had not been there, uh, um, probably the, 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 the decision on the, on the Bosman case would not have taken place because the pressure was so high on, on the player, on Jean-Marc Bosman, that you know, everything was there for him to say like, okay, I quit, this is it, I'm not gonna continue. And, and one of the reasons why he continued, one of course is because he's very courageous and, and, and as I say, he deserves all the credit, but 
we were also there besides him telling him like this is the right thing to do um and and helping him so so probably that uh the bosman ruling with the with the free uh movement of of players um when when fifth pro was founded in 1965 so actually it's a, a, a quite old organization but not much happened until 1995 with the with the bosman ruling of course there were meetings but it was not that much organized uh, a bit less members uh, of course much less power and through the the bosman ruling um, and the changes in the transfer system that led because of that ruling, uh, then we started to to have our place, let's say, in the in the football um, system, and and that led to all the the changes that came afterwards. If you think of it, uh, when the RST, RSTP was put in place, uh, and and the NDRC, uh, sorry, and the DRC, the FIFA DRC was created, uh, there we we already got. Um, uh, our our judges in the in the DRC and nowadays we have half of those judges appointed in the DRC are appoint are nominated by fifth pro. Uh, we also have representation in the player status committee. Uh, we are also represented in the in the football stakeholders committee uh, in this task force task forces to reform uh, the transfer system. Um, so. It is very clear that nowadays we are in a very different position than we than we were um, back then. Um, in 2015, we lodged a complaint uh, um, against the transfer system in the European Commission, um, and that led that opened a, a, a big door. Uh, you can criticize it or not, because we received a lot of, we were like, we were back then the, the boss man again, you know, getting all the hits like, oh, football will, football will die without a transfer system. Not thinking that most of other sports do not have one and they still survive anyway. Um, but what we were saying was in the agreement of 2001, um, the transfer system was allowed, let's say, by the European Commission, because there were some promises made, right? So we would strive for contractual stability, protect the minors, uh, concentrate on the on the education or, or training, um, a compensation distribution of the money um, with 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 um, with the clubs. Uh, there was a whole justification. And then we got to 2015, realizing that none of those objectives was there. So actually, what was the justification for the existence of the transfer system? When it should, in principle, be prohibited, of course, mm -hmm. because it's a great restriction. And, um, and, and well, of course, that led to a lot of discussions, meetings, blah, blah. blah. And it took really long because it was only in uh, November 2017 that we signed uh, our second uh, agreement with FIFA. The first one was signed, I think, in 2006, but it was a little bit more, you know, the typical MOU. Yes, we respect <laughs> each other, we recognize each other, but not much. But in 2017, we really signed a, a much in-depth document uh, with a lot of, of projects that we agreed to do in common, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the agreement was like, okay, we signed this agreement, we will work on the transfer, sy transfer system, and this is what we have been doing since then, uh, together with the other stakeholders, uh, and we will withdraw the, the claim in the European Commission. So that's what we did. Uh, and, and we are happy with the results, although not everything comes as easy as we thought or as soon as we thought or we as we would have wanted let's say but we do acknowledge that there is there are uh, steps that are being taken uh, and that and that the system as a whole works much better now and then um speaking about the 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 reform well the 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 to start with like though that article 12 b is for the overdue payables was very important because it really helped for the situation as i said this is one of the main issues for the players and then later on 
when the extra salaries were were added for the compensation uh, in case of, of uh, termination of the contract due to um, unpaid salaries. This was also something really important because we did see uh, now and then cases, and this was really heartbreaking, a case of a player that went through all the process of lodging a, a, a claim in the FIFA DRC, which used to take really long, because that is something that improved immensely, but I saw claims of five years long. So imagine waiting all those years and then getting a decision saying, you know what, you're right. The club reached the contract, you terminated with just cause, shame on that club, but you know what, you get zero because you got a job after you were fired by that club or you terminated with just cause, whatever, and it doesn't matter. And you find a new job. Yes, of course, you need to leave, you need to eat, so you need to work. So you will, as a player, do whatever you, you can to find a new job. So you found a new job and because you were earning the same as you would have earned in the previous club, then your compensation is zero. Jeez. So imagine the situation, imagine. And so this was something that was driving us crazy. And, uh, and, and well, we are quite happy. Probably it's not enough, but at least now for sure, the player will get three to six uh, salaries, which does help, right? Um, then um, what else? Article 24B is now is helping us a lot uh, in the execution because that was another problem. So you would wait all those years and uh, get your decision that 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 um, is not that generous anyway, right? Because you, you do not get uh, paid your legal fees, uh, the interest is low, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, yes, you have a beautiful decision, but then the club didn't pay and they had to start a new disciplinary procedure that would also take really long. Uh, so the Article 24 bis was um, and is uh, an excellent tool. Um, well, what else? Well, of course, now we will talk about the later, but the, the, the inclusion of the maternity regulations. In my view, this is completely um, incredible that, that we have now included this. Incredible, not in the sense that it's like, something that we did not expect. Of course, this should have been there uh, 20 years ago, but it's a massive change. I think that people do not realize the importance that this has, but that we will talk about later. So yeah, the, also the abolition of the grace periods, which was a big problem, for example, in Cyprus, in, in Greece. Um, I mean, lots of these bits, I think, are making it much better. That is at, 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 at FIFA level in terms of, of regulations. But of course, at national level, the impact of FIFPRO uh, is immense, especially because now we are much more, um, we're in a, we are in a much better relationship with FIFA, that is fair to say. So that we was my on... next question. <laughs> <laughs> What's the is... relationship with FIFA? Yeah, well, that it, it's, it is uh, much better and we are in continuous communication with the different departments. We work together a lot. So of course that is a great support for our unions and national level because now it's much less easy for the federations in their countries or the leagues to tell them like, who are you? You're nothing, you do not represent the players. Because we say, yes, they do because they are a member of FIFPRO. And if they are a member of FIFPRO, they are directly recognized by FIFA. And that is according to this agreement that I was referring to of November 2017. All our members are directly recognized by FIFA. So if Mama FIFA recognizes, the, the, the little kid uh, federation has to, right? Um, so, so yeah, so that, that is, of course, really important. Uh, but also the, the relevance of FIFPRO in terms of the support that we provide our members uh, in legal, but in many other aspects as well, and the support that they provide each other. So it's a, we base our organization in solidarity, right? And we get meetings, we have a platform where we share information and, and they, the members share information uh, with each other. They look at 
uh, for example, countries that are in a similar situation than theirs, and maybe you might be in a similar situation even if you are very far away geographically, right? And, and, and we learn a lot from each other, right? Also from FIFRO, from our members, of course. Um, so yeah, a little bit extended. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, was, it was very, very important uh, like, uh, to highlight these uh, this points. And uh, so I, what you were telling me is that uh, the relationship with FIFA has improved a lot in the, in the last years, because probably at the beginning, it wasn't exactly like that. There was not this kind of uh, union of, uh, of the points of view between uh, FIFA and FIFA. But, yes, uh, yes, definitely. I mean, I'm not saying that we agree in everything, right? Uh, sure not. Uh, but, but it's, I would say it's, it's much more professional now. I mean, we can agree to disagree and, and we can sit together and we can all still see the value of sharing the views. Um, and we do agree in many things, of course, we do agree in many things. And, and well, one, one of the examples that we're also going to talk about later uh, is, is the FIFA fund for players where we work together and, and we made it happen. Um, and like that, a million things. I mean, we work daily in the FIFA DRC together. We work, we work in the player status committee together um, every day. Uh, we are having a really good uh, relationship also in terms of uh, women football with a lot of meetings and exchange of information, uh, always trying to, you know, make football better in every sense. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's very, it's very good. Okay, 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 cool. And uh, I mean, um, talking about FIFA, uh, I have to, to ask you about the FIFA fund for, for football. Uh, we, that I think is a great, a uh, big change and like a big, uh, it could be of big support for all the football players uh, who couldn't uh, uh, be compensated in the past. And, but now, I mean, thanks to this, uh, um, this fund uh, created by FIFA, they could be compensated and continue to live probably. Meanwhile, they uh, can get a, a new job. So how, how, how does it work? We, um, how can a football player uh, make uh, the application uh, in order to, to get the, uh, this, this quantity of money? Uh, how much money is involved? Uh, uh, tell us, please, a little bit yes. more about this fund. Yeah, so we have been talking about this fund for probably years, I think, because um, it, it is something that we that we saw as a as a very big problem, and that was also a, a terrible situation, right? To see a, a club just disappear for whatever reasons. Uh, sometimes maybe a bit more naive, and sometimes not so much, but they just whoop, disappeared. And the players were there and like they don't have a job anymore and they had been waiting to be paid maybe for six months or sometimes even more. And, and, and then because they were disaffiliated from the Federation, then the players just didn't have anywhere to go to. And, um, and we have seen a lot of those cases and, and also it, it, it was terrible, right? Also leading to mental health problems and stuff, which I totally understand. Um, you can imagine the situation, um, and also it's it, it's so difficult to explain to the players that because the club went bust and is disaffiliated, that then no one has any obligation anymore, nor the federation, nor FIFA, no one, and they are like, but what are you saying? Like we always, everyone talks about the football family. Where's the family there, right? <laughs> and and it is difficult to understand, you know. Um, so uh, so yeah. So we were really really happy when when we could uh, make this happen. Uh, we worked really well with FIFA. FIFA had also a, a lot of will to to do this. Uh, so so yeah. So we were really happy when when it uh, came to light. However. When we started working with this, uh, because of course the the first period um, of the of the fund to allow the the amounts uh, has already uh, passed, 
and we were completely um, overwhelmed with the amount of uh, requests that we received. Um, it was and um, the, uh, the amount was more than 70 million dollars on on requests and we are talking about unpaid salaries eh? because the fund is only for overdue payable so it is not for compensation so if you have a decision of the fifa drc or of the ndrc or whatever saying that you are owed one hundred thousand dollars but the the part of the overdue salaries is twenty thousand then what you can request to the fund is only 20 right that okay. is something important to, to, to remember. So only talking about overdue payables, it was above $70 uh, million. And the, the allocated amount for the period was five, right? Yes. So um, yeah, it was insane. And we honestly, even being FIFRO, even knowing how, how bad the situation is, we did not expect that this amount would be so crazy. And we would we also did not expect that uh, that 70 percent of these requests came from the UEFA territory. Yeah, because 70 percent. That, that's like that's a big news because I was uh, talking about this uh, fund with uh, Victor Ocando, a colleague of us. And uh, we were talking about the situation in, uh, in his country, you know, Venezuela. So uh, we um, were, I mean, I mean, our conversation was more based like, oh, it's, uh, it's a very uh, big thing for, for example, some South American countries or uh, Asian countries, uh, you know. But the reality is very different, is that uh, even in Europe, in the rich uh, Europe, if you don't think about uh, uh, the big fives or like the uh, first division leagues, uh, you can face this kind of this kind of problem. And yeah, uh, so this is happening with the financial fair play yeah. and with all the the. So it's it's really incredible. And there, of course, we call for you know the 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 attention and the actual contribution of the confederations as well, right? Because it seems that. If 70% 70, 70 of these requests came from the UEFA territory, maybe UEFA also should contribute a little bit to the fund, right? And then we 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 could have a, a higher amount because the current situation, we have not yet allocated the amounts because as I said, we were completely overwhelmed and the the process is taking longer than we than we expected. Uh, but the truth is that of course the players will receive much less than they than they would be entitled to because um the total amount is five million and um, so make the math <laughs> it's yeah so it's it was a it was something amazing like we were really happy last year and this year it's a bit like brrr. so it's still something great in principle and and also of course this first period covered more years so we expect that the for the coming periods, the, the request will be less. It should be because it's a, a shorter period of time. Uh, but but yeah, definitely the numbers maybe should be uh, reviewed, right? We need more money for the funds, um, that, that for sure. And, and another question that comes to my mind is, uh, is related to the COVID-19. Uh, COVID I mean, I probably, I, I already know the which will be the answer, but uh, which was the the impact of uh, of the pandemic in the in this kind of uh, contractual relationship between uh, football players and uh, and clubs? Uh, because I mean, we saw that, uh, for example, also in Italy uh, there are clubs uh, very important, like uh, for example Inter, uh, which uh, and Inter did not pay on exactly on time the salaries of the football players, and we are talking about. Inter, uh, which is a, a big club, and uh, so I can imagine how is the situation all over the world. But uh, my question is: mm, Have been already some immediate consequences, or it's something like still ongoing? Well, the, yeah, for sure there have been already consequences, right? Um, 
I, I think that like to simplify it a lot, there were two 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 ways of addressing this um, by clouds. I mean, right? Or or actually by all the national stakeholders, let's say. So you can you can acknowledge the situation and then be sincere and be open and show your numbers as a club and say like, listen, this is my situation. These are all the measures that I will take, which of course cannot only include the salaries of the players. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm willing to pay everything. I just cannot do it now. Let's work on a plan on how we do this. That is one approach and it has happened a lot and, and we were happy with those. But the other approach was, okay, uh, the, pan the, the global pandemic was declared on the 13th March, if I'm not what? mistaken. On the 14th, they were already announcing measures like for the next five years, uh, players will earn half. And, and you're like, okay, I mean, if you, if you think of it now, it's already been almost a year of the pandemic and it's a very different situation. But back then we didn't know if the global pandemic would take one month or two weeks or who knew, you know? So there were lots of abuses in this sense, like very disgusting, you know, like just disgusting. Um, they were like clearly taking advantage. Of, exactly, of exactly. Um, and then, or bringing in like their projects that they already had in mind, but they could not impose in the country and, and putting the, the pandemic as, as an excuse, uh, you know, to impose salary caps, to, to impose changes in the, in the tournament. Um, so that is something that we are seeing more now in, in this uh, last months. Uh, so intentions of uh, imposing unilaterally salary caps um, at national level without considering, you know, context, consequences, uh, minimums, because before you even name the, the word cap, talk to me about a minimum salary, right? Not the salary uh, cap, but the minimum. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah, so there are, of course, a lot of consequences. And then many players that did not play or, or barely played during 2020 because their tournaments from the second division, for example, were not resumed or in case of women football, in many cases, uh, it was taken as a, uh, you know, as a secondary problem. So they just thought like, ah, let's, you know, not even start with this tournament, um, which, which is of course um, terrible for the development of football in the country and, and for the players, of course, as well, that are not working and for everything. But, um, but I mean, without being too positive, I think that in a certain moment, people expected much worse. So in the end, it's difficult to, to speak globally because there were countries that were a disaster. But, you know, except those in general, it prevailed more or less the common sense. There was a lot of negotiation, you know, players and clubs sitting together, trying to find an agreement, um, you know, uh, well, from, from our unions, we saw this immense solidarity, the pay unions going to, to, you know, just give out food because there were players that were, did not have any, even money to, to, to go to the supermarket, you know. Uh, and we saw this in so many places that it was also quite concerning, but like the global reaction of everyone really with using um, a showing solidarity was, was um, yeah, quite, quite good to see. And then in the end, when activities resumed, then more or less things, uh, yeah, improved. But then of course, when it stops again, then it's, you know, it's like we go forward and, back, and backwards. Um, but I think it was really good, of course, what, what FIFA did with the, with the guidelines, the COVID-19 uh, guidelines, because that did help uh, a bit to stop the abuses or to reduce them, not to stop them, but to reduce them. And we have had already quite some cases in the FIFA DRC, and, and it is very clear, you know, that if there is no attempt from the club to negotiate a salary cut or whatever, that, that is just not accepted. It's, it, it, just does you know it's uh, completely rejected so um i think that in that sense 
and it's good because at national level they are learning that they need to negotiate and sit together and respect the players. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you, of course. And uh, you, you mentioned, uh, I mean, FIFPRO as a global union of football players. And when we think about football players, we also have to consider female football players. So in the last years, uh, we saw that the women football has developed a lot. I mean, uh, I remember in 2019, the women uh, FIFA Women World Cup was like a, a big success. And it was like a, a point of change uh, in the global consideration of women football. And I, I also remember that the level was, was quite good, that there was a lot of interest um, on it. But do you think that the, the pandemic uh, in some way stopped this development like uh, irreparably? Or do you think that uh, there are some, some, some changes, uh, uh, but uh, the, the situation has not changed a lot like uh, um, we can see uh, from, like, from, the, from an external point of view? Uh, how Fifth Pro is also dealing with, with, with it? Uh, yeah, well, I think that, of course, if the pandemic wouldn't have happened, probably uh, last year would have been an amazing year for women football, definitely. Um, and it was not, but it was also not that bad. So in general terms, again, so of course, there were some countries that did not handle it well, and they did not have their tournament. So as I said before, but in general terms, it's still um, continued its growth. Um, and so I don't think it did harm it, but not irreparably. And we, um, what we did from, from, from our side, let's say, so already in, in April, we, um, we published some guidelines in order to, you know, tackle the COVID-19 in women football, because we did it also for uh, players in general, but we thought we need something specific for women football, because of course, um, it's, women football was, you know, starting to really, really uh, come out and, and, and develop uh, a flourish, let's say. And so to, to attack it at that period, it's, it's um, much more dangerous, let's say. So if you, if you have a, a financial difficulty in a well-established club that is wealthy, etc., of course, it's much easier to tackle than and maybe a small women's football club that is only starting and was actually hoping to have the, the first income in, in 2020. Um, so that's why we thought like, actually what we need now is like special attention to women football and extra support for women football. And um, I think that FIFA uh, had a good reaction in terms of uh, the amounts granted and stating specifically, this has to go specifically for women football then I don't know if it worked, or I don't know, no. I know it did not work that well in really getting there, right? But I mean, I don't know if, if FIFA is to blame because can they really control, it should, the system should, should work as a whole. So uh, if the federations were not doing their job, um, yeah, they should, they should be sanctioned probably, but sometimes the federations did, but then the clubs didn't and the, you know, the whole change but chain uh, did not work the best way possible. Sometimes it did, but many times it, it didn't. So I think it was a really good approach from FIFA, maybe for the future to try to, um, to check a little bit more or be on top of it in terms of, does it really get to the players, you know? Or does it really get to the development of women football? Or did half of the money got there? Or did nothing got, get there, you know? I mean, how can... With that money that was paid, how could some clubs or even leagues say we cannot compete this year? You know, it's not so expensive because most of those clubs, they have also a male affiliate, so they can share pitches and stuff like that. So it's not that it would be a, an immense cost. And we know that the salaries of the women players, unfortunately, is not that high. So it's not that it was it's such a great investment. Um, but well, 
uh, but but no, I think that uh, there's still more to do and more emphasis has to do has to be done uh, on on you know uh, taking care of of women football especially. Uh, but I I am happy to see that it's still developed that it's still there. I mean, you see there are little things there are little. Uh, um, facts that show you that it's still relevant and it's still interesting for the fans, which is of course so important. Like you saw it with the World Eleven, um, uh, where you know the players were really eager to vote their teammates, and people were watching and they wanted to know which was uh, the the best team in the world according to the to the football players themselves. Um, so yeah, I think that the interest is still there. But there are a lot of things to review. Something that, that we are concerned about is, of course, we need to look into the health of, of the players and of the staff and of everyone due to the COVID-19. But especially for women football, we need to make sure that there are still tournaments. Because uh, while male players in general are playing too much, and actually we also have a research on that, <laughs> right? Um, women players are playing too little and if they don't play enough then they cannot continue developing then the fans do not completely engage you know it's a cycle so the competitions of women football have to be a priority and they are still not so yeah that's one of the things to look at thank you thank you uh, it uh, i was very curious to to ask you about that and I'm happy to see that, I mean, the process is still ongoing and it hasn't stopped. And uh, talking about women football, we can, uh, we can arrive to the heart of our conversation, <laughs> which is the, the new FIFA RSTP amendment regarding uh, maternity leave. I, I read that um, according to this new modification, this new amendment, the article 18.7 um, is saying that the female football players will be granted of a maternity leave of 14 weeks. And so, uh, and, and like eight weeks immediately after giving birth. So could you tell us how you managed to arrive to this um, amendment and how it which will be the, the real impact in the women's football. Yeah, well, this is something that we are, we feel really uh, proud about. Um, it's something that we were also chasing for for a while. Um, we have been um, having meetings with FIFA regarding this, and and to be honest, we we had a really good reception from FIFA. So from from day one, they they agreed that this had to be inserted. Then of course you have a lot of of, of discussions or negotiations on on how to and you know how far and well but from day one i remember speaking with emilio garcia and and you know he's saying yeah, yeah of course we need to include this like it has to be there it's crazy that it's not there actually um so so the the process started probably i think it was december 2019 yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and uh, and then we started with negotiations and planning, and then the uh, it was going quite smoothly. But uh, when they were about to send us, you know, that first draft saying like, okay, we this is the regulations that we think we should have because we as Fifth Pro we were proactive in this sense, so we created our own parental policy, what we call the parental policy, and that's what we deem should be there as a very minimum, right? Mm -hmm. So it is far from an ideal thing. So if we could ask for, we, we would ask, let's say for more, but like just thinking, okay, what is the reality? What is achievable? Okay, so we created this uh, parental policy and, and that was the first document that we shared with FIFA explaining how we had reached to those uh, propositions, to the numbers, to the lengths of the maternity leave, et cetera, et cetera, because what we did was let's be smart about this. What is the best way to look at the information ILO, right? If the International Labour Organization says this is the minimum, it's quite hard then to argue otherwise. So that's how we, we started. And then uh, and FIFA, uh, I think it was for the first time that they really looked into the 
into the ILO in order to incorporate in, in, their, in the regulation. And that is, in the relations, and that is a massive message actually, because there is, I mean, FIFA has for many years already recognized uh, players as workers, but you know, that FIFA is also giving the message to the, to the federations and to the clubs and to the leagues. Okay, when I regulate, I look at the ILO, it's quite a stand. And, um, and well, then uh, when FIFA was about to send us their draft, uh, COVID came and then of course it was not a priority anymore. So everything was a little bit delayed, but uh, we were really happy that it could still be um, you know, implemented um, as from 1st January. So it's now on actually, uh, which is like, wow, it's there. Uh, so now we have to see, of course, how everything develops, right? Um, it's not going to be an easy one because of course it was included as a mandatory disposition. So all federations at national level have to include this exactly in their um, RSTP at national level. They have to include them. Uh, and this is of course something else that is very important and that we sometimes get questions about. And I think in the text is clear, but it's very important to mention that these are minimums. This, these are minimums. So of course, if the national law uh, provides for a longer period uh, that is applicable to players, if there's a, a, a collective bargaining agreement at national level that uh, it, by which it was agreed that you would get a longer maternity leave or that you would get fully paid because what we have now in the, in the regulations is a minimum of two thirds. This is uh, the minimum uh, suggestion of the ILO as well. Um, then of course uh, those would prevail, right? The ones that are, that were agreed at national level. Um, but when we talk about if the national legislation provides differently, we're talking about national legislation. We're not talking about regulations of federations, of course. <laughs> uh, but it's worth mentioning <laughs> just in case. Yeah. And then in terms of the length of the maternity leave, uh, oh, well, yeah, and then. Uh, are we 100% happy with this amendment? Uh, no, we are very happy, but uh, we wanted a little bit more. We wanted some things a little bit different, but of course, um, the, the, how, how uh, the RSTP is, is um, modified now is by agreement and we needed also, of course, to, to negotiate, let's say, with ECA and with the European Clubs Association um, with World League Forum uh, and with FIFA. So of course, yeah, you cannot get uh, everything you want, but this is absolutely uh, fantastic to start with. We will push for more, definitely. FIFA wants more too. Um, yesterday I was listening to Emilio in the IAF conference um, mm -hmm. and he was confirming it uh, uh, publicly because he had already told us that to us. But yes, he said it publicly, so I can repeat it. <laughs> but once more, too. So uh, the idea was like, okay, let's get this out, um, start implementation, but we will keep on working on this because, uh, yeah, there are more things to consider. For example, something that we really wanted to include was uh, the non bearing child parent leave. Mm. Um, so that would be uh, the case of of um, it can be the husband or the wife, you know, because it, it depends. It can be, of course, any kind of uh, couple, but that the other parent, let's say, also has a possibility to have some uh, free days. But of course, this was much more tricky because we're talking about male players as well. <laughs> and who dares to say that Messi can take 15 days off if he gets a, a child, you know? <laughs> and then people freak out. Uh, forgetting that Messi is also a person besides being a great football player. Um, well, he has to renounce to a Clásico for taking care of his uh, kid. Uh, crazy, you know, impossible. <gasps> I can imagine like the average person saying that. Exactly. I mean, I, I, I have heard some conferences, you know, people saying like, yeah, well, but I, I heard this and I w I'm, so, I'm still shocked when I say it. I heard this comment. Well, if it's an important match, I mean, you can always record the birth of your child because we were talking, we were not even, we were not talking about the leave. We were talking about 
being able to attend the birth of your kid, right? And they were like, yeah, but you can always have that recorded, you know? But the match, and I was like, <laughs> whoa, really? Are we comparing the birth of your child with a match, whatever match it is? Wow. Um, and I love football too, but come on, <laughs> like priorities sometimes are not well established, I guess. Um, but well, so imagine that if there's a discussion on that, on the date of the birth, imagine for the leave. But still, even if, it's the, if there's discussion, we're going to completely uh, push for that, definitely, uh, because it's insane that they would not have it. Um, so yeah, our, our aim is to get at least 15 days for, for those uh, non-bearing child parents, uh, who also of course has a, have the right and the responsibility. I mean, come on, poor, uh, poor, uh, very mother, you know, that, that have the child there and then she's like, goodbye, I'm, I'm on tour. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you also speak as a mother, probably I would have killed my husband if he was not there during the birth of my child, my children. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, we, now we, we talk about one hot topic, uh, which is the one related to the maternity leave. Then I have another curiosity. I mean, I know that FIFPRO is a union of football players, but another hot topic is that FIFA re finally recognized officially the, the figure of coach. So uh, when I was uh, in, in the law firm, when I worked and when we assisted the coaches uh, there was always this kind of of thinking that uh, oh if if coaches had a global union like football players they would have more like uh, guarantees so according to your experience it, is this true and do you think that like the fifth pro experience could be of some help for coaches uh, have you been uh, uh, asked for an assistant uh, for from from coaches from a possible global union of coaches what do you think about that um well yeah i first of all i definitely think that yeah having a union would would help them of course because when you're organized you have much more more power definitely i mean um nowadays from the employee side we are the the ones globally let's say uh organized and and it it shows that we are the ones that are sitting at the table right um so so yeah if i could recommend it then definitely it's not so easy to start but uh, and then of course uh we are there to help um, anyone that that you know wants to protect uh, labor rights in 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 any sense but it's not our core so of course we are uh, protecting um professional football players so we can you know give tips or have a meeting that's that wouldn't be a a problem but uh but yeah let's say that that's it and actually that's what we expressed as well um during the negotiations of the of the coaches regulations because we were also there at the table and we expressed immediately that we were you know flattered to be invited to that meeting but that actually did not concern us uh that we deemed that the coaches had to be sitting at the table. And even though there's not an orga uh, a global organization, there are some important organizations at national level that maybe, you know, we could have been reached out for, for a consensus. Um, so we just made some general remarks, you know, in terms of, you know, labor law or whatever. And, and one, of, one of the things that I remember also mentioning, I mean, in, on one hand, I think it, it, was, it was really good for, for coaches. On the other hand, some of the of the dispositions that are now applied to them are some of the ones that we have always complained about. So I'm like, oh, poor dudes, you know, now they're also in the same bag, although they also got all the benefits that we strive for, you know, so in a, in a way they were benefited by by our uh, by our work. But, you know, um, there are some bits uh, that that are a problem uh, and and. I we, uh, yesterday Emilio got the question as well, like does this mean that now coaches only have um, a limited period, uh, a term period uh, contract, um, and he was uh, doubting a little bit, but it seems so, right, if you, if you look at the, at the conclusions, and we were wondering whether that, to start with, 
is something positive for the coaches or not. I mean, it will, of course, depend on the on the national level and the national regulation as well. But um, yeah, I mean, we. I remember saying in the meeting, like, listen, we have had so many fights about the RSTP and the implementation and the transfer system, and now we're putting coaches in the bag, <laughs> you know, without asking them. I so. I think that they are happy anyway, because, you know, just not being regulated is a bit like when there's, if there's complete uncertainty. And uh, so, so I understand. And I think it was very well intended. And I think that probably it will have a very good result. Definitely. I'm not saying uh, otherwise, but it was not that easy, you know, like uh, to imitate. it's not like the, the super model to imitate. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Good, uh, Alexandra, I, you will be happy to see that we received a lot of questions. <laughs> so very, very, very different kind of, of questions. And I, I have to, to ask uh, some, of, some of them. Uh, and there is an anonymous attendee uh, who asked you that, uh, uh, that who, who mentioned that the fact that you say that um, uh, there are 70 members of FIFPRO. And uh, he's, he's asking, uh, uh, what is the membership process for a country to join FIFPRO? I, I think yeah, we, okay. can, we can talk about uh, uh, national union and not, not country. Yeah. But... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's national union or national player association. Um, so the process, uh, it depends a little bit. It can be that there's already an organization at national level and that then they would like to become a member of FIFPRO. And it could be that there are some players that um, really want to, you know, organize and they reach out to us like help, help. So we do not create unions or, or player associations at national level. But if there are players that uh, need some help, we have a, a status of observers. So they would they do not become a member still, mm -hmm. but they, they they become observers and then we we help them a little bit with best practices, you know, a little, on, on different things. If there is already an organization, and that is one of the requirements that we have, you know, to 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 have to be a legal entity, let's say, um, then we will we will check some requirements that that uh, it complies with, uh, you know, democratic principles. Uh, we will check that it has uh, enough uh, professional football players affiliated. So if only I don't know one fourth of the players. Uh, professional players are affiliated. Uh, it's a little bit more tricky. If if it's substantial, then uh, of course we we check that. We also check uh, their numbers. Um, uh, yeah, like all the 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 typical um, uh, checks that you need to do. Uh, but but the most important thing is that it's an organization that exists in order to protect the labor rights of the players at national level. That is the the most important. And then how that organization is called, if it's a union or if it's a players association, uh, so like civil association, then that's not so important to us. Also because in some countries, it's not even possible to have a union. Uh, in some countries, it's not advisable to have a union. In some countries, uh, the word union is already seen as a kind of insult almost. So it's not always the best option to have a union itself, although, um, theoretically and, and actually in practice, the, the structure of a union is very powerful and that is the, the, the initial thing that you should aim at. But if it's not possible or desirable at national level, then you can always have a players association. But uh, those are more or less the, the things that we looked at. We look at and we have a whole system. It's a little bit complicated, but we have a whole system. Uh, where they need to upload, you know, their statutes, their figures, their membership and everything. So that we really check everything and then they can apply for membership. And then you start off being a candidate member. Uh, and then after uh, some time you can become, um, let's say, a full member of uh, FIFPRO. Okay, okay, very clear. And uh, now another question from uh, Andre Gribel, who is like the co-founder of the our uh, channel sports talks at Calle Serrano, and uh, he 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 mentioned the abusive clauses that you already mentioned before. And uh, his uh, his question is: What efforts FIFA, together with FIFA, 
um, do um, on avoiding clubs pressuring abusive clauses in foreign players? Uh, well, in foreign and in, and in national, I mean, actually, it's wor it's it's worse for the national players because the international players can go to the FIFA DRC, and the FIFA DRC will clearly state that those clauses are abusive. At national level, the problem is much bigger. Why? Because ninety five percent of the member associations of the federations do not comply with the circular ten ten and eleven twenty nine of FIFA, which determine very clearly that all the MAs or federations need to have an NDRC that is compliant, that is paritary, that is uh, free of charge, et cetera, independent. So because they do not have that, the, the dispute resolution at national level is a major concern that we have at FIFPRO. And this is one of the things that we are working together uh, with, with FIFA. Uh, it comes from that agreement that I referred to from 2017. Um, the plan was really good. The execution is not going that well, to be honest. Um, so our plan was to, to make like uh, these working groups, uh, this working group like a task force, let's say, to implement uh, NDSCs at national level in different countries. And we have done that. But the thing is that the idea was that within six months, those NDRCs would be ready. And the truth is that in, in many of those projects, we are uh, way above two years and they are not implemented yet. So some have been, uh, but it's, it proved to be more difficult than it, than it seemed. And it proved as well that probably it's not in the higher list of priorities of FIFA because they are not sanctioning their members for not complying with their own regulations because these NDRCs are compulsory. So <laughs> there should be no discussion uh, on whether it will be implemented or not. And FIFA has also taken the time and effort to create the FIFA regulations for national dispute resolution chambers uh, so there is a regulation, they just need to grab it, copy it, change something if it's very necessary, and then you have the beautiful uh, NDRC in practice. And still having that tool, uh, it is immensely difficult to, to implement. So of course FIFA is working on this, I'm not saying that they are not, we are working together on this, on this project. Um, and, uh, and and there there is willingness, but I just you know it make it frustrates me, frustrates me that they have the power to sanction and they do not in this in this aspect you know, um, and now we are looking into different options also together with FIFA to see whether maybe regional NDRCs would be a, a good solution. But in the end, even if you do it regional, as long as you do not enforce your regulations and make sure that that regional NDRC also complies. And if they do not comply that you sanction them, then probably it will also not work. So um, so I know there are lots of efforts, probably it's, it's coming from, you know, upper, uh, but but uh, the, the colleagues in FIFA are doing a, a, great, a great effort. And then of course, maybe they're not um, allowed to do more, let's say. Great. Another question by Victor Ocando is, uh, he's saying great conversation, uh, Lucia and Alexandra, fantastic job by FIFPRO. Thank you, Victor. Uh, his question is, uh, in regard of the work of FIFPRO to protect those players of uh, USL or leagues before, below USL that are not part of MLS or MLSPA, how does FIFPRO work for these other leagues in the United States? No, so what we have in FIFPRO in, in our membership, there's something I didn't uh, mention is that we have one member per country. So um, in the USA, it's the MLSPA and that is our member. So the, in the best uh, case scenario, our member should uh, comprehend uh, all the professional players in the country Sometimes it is more difficult than in others, in other uh, cases. Uh, and when it does not, we sometimes have some, you know, uh, conversations or, or agreements with, with other organizations, but our member will always be one. 
So in the case of the of the United States, uh, the MLSBA is our member. Okay, okay, okay. Another question by Tony Sharkey. What is FIFPRO's view of a countries about countries who impose salary caps? We disagree with it. <laughs> very, very easy and plain. Yeah, we disagree with it. Um, we what we believe in is in collective bargaining uh, agreements, right? Um, so it could eventually be that in a certain scenario you could get to that, and you know, with a lot of circumstances around being tackled. Uh, but but in principle and very strongly, we disagree with the imposition of salary caps. We think it's a very it's kind of this argument that sells and you and they go out like, yeah, we need to put a salary cap because players earn, earn too much. Okay, let's look at let's look at the numbers. Let's look at the clubs. Let's see how much the clubs earn and how much the, the players earn. Let's see how much the ones that are in the lower part earn. Let's see if they can end, if they can make ends meet with that. And let's see if players are play are paid every month. Because to start with, do not cap me if you don't even pay my salary on time. So, you know, there are many things around this and it's like the typical, it's, it's kind of such an, such an easy way out. Like, oh, we have financial problems. What do we do? Salary cap. It, it, yeah. We don't think it's a, it's a way out. And I mean, for us, of course, we're not uh, that much concerned about those players that earn uh, an enormous amount of money. But um, we know that they could live with less, of, of course. But we also know that those players that earn that enormous amount of money are very, very few in percentage. They are the top stars and their clubs are not extremely generous and that's why they earn a lot of money. Their clubs are making a lot of money and that's why they have that salary. So they are worth it. Believe me, they are not giving that for free. So, you know, I, I find it a very easy argument and, you know, kind of simple. Yeah, got it. <laughs> Alex uh, Rojas is asking uh, you, when a player deals with a non-payment uh, late or a late payment issue with a club, does a player go directly to Fifth Pro after having exhausted all avenues with the club? or the player can choose to go to the DRC by passing fifth pro. I will say the second one, but the floor is yours. Yeah, no, I mean, we are not a, we are not a dispute resolution <laughs> instance, so no one has to go through us. People come to us many times because they need help and we are there to support them. Um, so no one is uh, imposed uh, fifth pro there, like, you know, we would never do that. Um, so, yeah, actually, the, the player would go to the FIFA DRC if it's an international dispute. Remember that. So the DRC is not available for every player and otherwise at national level. But I would advise them uh, uh, that if, if they have a union at, their, at, the, at the country of the club where they are working, uh, that they would go uh, there and, and first check with them. certain requirements that others don't so it's very good to always be well informed and if there uh, another one by andre uh, which is in some countries players are allowed by law to receive a percentage of transfer fee should be should this be something applied worldwide what is your opinion about that um yeah maybe but yeah i think it's something that you can collectively uh bargain it's not something that we deem is um fundamental it does make sense it does make it makes sense if i mean <laughs> to me this is very personal. To me, nothing makes sense, actually. So it doesn't make sense that 
one employer is paying to another employer to buy a person, which, you know, in practical terms, it's kind of what happens. Um, but if that would be the case, then yes, why doesn't the employee have the right to a part of that, you know? Uh, especially when that is going to be used against that player. So we, we have this crazy, we don't stop, we don't stop to think about how crazy the transfer system is, like the whole thing, you know? I am a player and I am transferred from club A to club B. And then uh, there's a breach of contract. Maybe I breached the contract, yes, because players are human and sometimes they make a mistake or they make a decision Maybe it's wrong, maybe it's right for whatever thing, right? My father is sick and I want to go home. Is that wrong? I don't think so. But I did breach the contract, right? So I go back home. Then the club will say, okay, now you have to pay to me compensation. And the compensation is not like for the player, the rest value of the contract. They will also add a lot more like the non-amortized uh, transfer fee amount. What is that? It is insane. If the player did not negotiate the, 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 the number of the transfer fee, the player is not involved in, in that part of the negotiation. And the player is normally not getting anything of that. Like these clubs, the, these countries that, that uh, Andre was referring to are the exception. But normally the player doesn't get anything. So you don't get anything. You don't have a say on it. You, of course, you have a say in the sense of, Yes, I agree to transfer, or I don't agree to transfer, but you don't have a say in the amounts or anything like that. And I mean, you don't even have a say that much sometimes in, in, one, in moving or not, right? Because if you're told by your club, which happens a lot, either you move or you will be benched forever. I don't know if you then have much of a choice, but that aside, uh, we have this crazy system where this is put on the shoulders of the, of the player. So, Analyzing in that way, I would answer yes to Andre. Yes, everyone should have. <laughs> but this is my view. I'm not talking on behalf of FIFA. I don't know actually what the position. Uh, no, be, yeah. yes, uh, uh, your um, your personal view. So I mean, you were very clear in answering uh, to this uh, this question. <laughs> A very straight point of view. And uh, so uh, we are coming to the end of our conversation and uh, I, I have to, to ask you like the typical final question of, of this kind of conversation talks uh, webinar. So considering the, the big results uh, which Fifth Pro achieved uh, until now and also the, the global situation and uh, for a big result like the, the last one, the maternity leave, uh, which are now exactly the main uh, challenges that uh, FIPRO will face in the, in the next future, which are like the next goals, uh, the next uh, objectives? Um, yeah, well, there are many things that are ongoing, right? It's like we have achieved a lot, but nothing is yet in the state of perfection. So to start with, uh, we need to keep on working on all these fields it is still basic and very important and very relevant, uh, the, the non-payment issue. That is something that we still need to tackle uh, harder. And of course, we are still in negotiation with FIFA regarding uh, the, the third package, let's say, as they call it. Um, so all that still needs to be concluded. What is going to happen with the training compensation? That is something that we are really worried about as well. There is also something that the player ha carries in his uh, shoulders and and maybe uh, in the future in her shoulders because now it's not there but you know uh, mm. it's not set in stone I, either so um, that is something that needs to be resolved in the in the best possible way and then of course women football uh, is a high priority for 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 us uh, to support you know we can uh, in order to to better develop develop uh, and have the, the legitimate, let's say, conditions, uh, the playing conditions, the working conditions, and the tournament conditions, because we still have we still have a situation where, despite the the um, the really good actions that FIFA have taken in the in the near past, and the speech that I believe in, I'm not saying that you know it's only a speech; it's you know a clear idea. 
But despite that, if we look at the conditions for the tournaments, the World Cup for the men and the World Cup for the women, for example, we see that the conditions are much worse for the women. So how can a, an international organization and non-for-profit, remember, international organization as FIFA say, we are gonna treat you equally, you are equal to us. And the money invested in the World Cup does not derive from profits. It's not how it's done. And there is enough money, believe me, in FIFA. How is it possible to justify that the conditions are at least exactly the same? How is it possible? And I know that it has improved and that is super welcome. And sometimes it's difficult to have change really quickly, but still, how can it be justified? So um, I don't know, many, many things to work on, too much. <laughs> that keeps us busy every day. I can imagine, I can imagine. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Alexandra. It was really a pleasure for me to, to talk with you. And to, I, I was, as I told you before, I was very curious to ask you a lot of questions and uh, it's incredible to see the, the passion that you show in your work uh, with all of your uh, garra charrua. <laughs> 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 I can feel that. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope to, to, to meet you very soon in, uh, when uh, the pandemic will uh, allow us to meet uh, personally in conferences, congresses, and, and all of that when the world will be back to, to the normality. Yeah, Finger hopefully. <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, for the invitation. It was a pleasure for me as well. And uh, thank you also to the attendees and, and, and for the participation, for all the questions. And, um, and in case someone still has something to ask, uh, you can always reach out to me in my uh, email. It's a.gomez at fifro.org. So um, yeah, whatever you need, uh, we are there for you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, have a nice weekend, Alexandra. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.